I wanted to start off today by thanking Mary for sponsoring me and sponsoring these programs. And it's just been so wonderful to be back in Hanover and spending time here and, and with Dartmouth students. So I've worked at several schools in the Ivy League, including the University of Pennsylvania. And I think that Dartmouth students and alumni have a really unique strength in their ability to network. And I think that's really important. And I'm going to start out with a couple questions designed to help you see how important that is in your job search. And my first question to you is how much time does the average job seeker spend online every month looking for a job? Every month? Every month. Okay, so hours. How many hours? 20, 20, between 20 and 70 hours? Anyone have any other guesses? I would say it's a column. Mm -hmm. so, so does anyone else have any, any other guesses? Okay. According to risesmart.com, the average job seeker in the U.S. spends 50 hours a month searching for positions, which is more than a 40-hour work week or one, per, one person does through full-time employment in a regular job or in a traditional job in which one only spent 40 hours a week. But we know that many of you are on a fast track to spend more time than that at your job once you land one. So 50 hours a week. Now what percentage of people do you think find jobs through networking? 68%. 68%? Anyone else have a, have a guess? 68% is just about right. Most studies gauge it between 60 and 80% of all job opportunities after all is said and done are through networking. And so today we're going to focus on the technology. We're going to focus on quick tips that you can use to speed up the efficiency of your search. But I want to leave you with the thought that the most important thing, even after you learn these cool tools and tricks, is to really focus on the relationship building, expanding your reach, defining your online presence, and focus on the relationship building. Because no matter how you choose to spend your time, your best results are going to come from a combination of the networking and presenting yourself professionally and using the tools efficiently. So I'm going to start off today with a general recipe for a successful job search. Um, one of the reasons that I named my consulting company in New York City Best Fit Forward is because I found after eight years of working with Ivy League students that the best type of position and the best people who are the happiest in their jobs are the people who figured out before they even go into the interview what the right work environment is for them, what the right industry and the right job function. Because you can be in the right job function and the wrong culture and not have a position work. Or you can be in the right culture but in, in, a, in a position that just doesn't fit you at all in terms of your colleagues and your coworkers. So it's really important to figure out yourself, ideally, um, in terms of what your work preferences and styles are and, and your group projects your classes, you know, whether you work best in a um, conference, collaborative, colloquial style class or a lecture hall. All of those things give you tips on what's going to be the best work environment for you. Um, so first, in terms of having a successful job search, you want to know what's going to work out best for you and then you want to look at employers who are going to fit that need, but you also, in terms of selling yourself to them, it doesn't work if you just say, this is what I need, because employers are always thinking about themselves, which makes sense. They hire you to fill a need. So the second thing that you need to do is always find out what the employer needs. The Dartmouth Career Network has thousands of people and alumni who are willing to answer questions for you about what an industry is like, what a position is like, what a career path looks like, and you can access that through Dartmouth Career Services and get suggested questions 
to ask alumni in terms of figuring out what employers need. Um, the third thing you need to do in a successful job search is to find leads. You know, find out who's hiring and how to, how to have your skills align with those employer needs. And that's what Dartmouth Career Services and Carrie's office also can help you do. Um, finally, you want to articulate your fit for the position. And I'm going to show you a few research tools today, which will help you conduct employer research in, for most jobs in 45 minutes or less. And finally, you want to customize your application. And again, you can use that same information, that research that you do, also in customizing your application. So again, in terms of identifying the ideal position, you want to do some self-assessment, you want to research employers, you want to scout for leads, and you want to apply for jobs. And ideally, you want to tailor and tag team your application with inside contacts. So in other words, if you're applying for a postdoc position at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, you might want to see if you can find any other Dartmouth alumni who are at the University of Tennessee at, Dar at Knoxville who can give you the inside scoop about what the school is like and then let them know you've applied. Because if they have any affiliation or relationship with that department, they can say, I know her. She's great and put in a good word for you. So that's a really important aspect of the overall search. Um, as going back to a week ago, um, we, we sat here today and we talked about the importance of online presence. And one of the things that I said I, I find very helpful is setting up what's called a Google News Alert. And this is something that you can set up very easy, easily. It takes about five minutes. And you can set up a search on both your name or any keywords or search terms that you want to find out about. So for example, um, I'd like to get a real life example from one of you about an interest you might have. Okay, so biotech consulting and what city would you like to work in? New York. New York. Okay, so for example, you could program in a search term for an alert that said biotech consulting or biotech consulting firms Manhattan or New York and innovation or announcements and every time that hits Google in a news clipping it's going to send those results to you and you can customize how often you want to receive those you can say I want to receive them as it happens you can set it on a particular company name um, you can also receive it just once a day or once a week. Um, just once a day seems like a lot, so let's back that off to just once a week. So you can receive that, and that's a really invaluable tool to use in employer research. Also, you can go to Google's regular site, which is news.google.com. You may want to write this down because it's not in your handout, but that's a great place to find a nugget or two for a cover letter. So you know how when you're writing a cover letter, you always have to say, this is why I'm interested in the company? You can use that piece of information that you get from Google News Alerts or from the news.google.com site to say something interesting about the company. So let's say you're applying to work at a biotechnical consulting firm or a biotech consulting firm in Manhattan who's being funded by Pfizer and Pfizer's just made an announcement that they're going to acquire another company as well. That's the type of thing that you could add in your cover letter um, overall, which could show your familiarity with the field that you're applying for, which helps the employer understand how you're a fit for the job. So if you can show in your cover letter that you un and your resume that you understand the culture and the overall overall state of the industry in which you're applying, that can be very helpful in terms of moving you forward. So Google Alerts are one thing. Again, they help you monitor your online presence. I always recommend setting a Google News Alert on your own name. If you share your name with a million other people, so for example, if you're the guy I met a couple weeks ago named Dave Matthews, you know, you've got a, a little bit different of a challenge. So you might change your, your 
Google News Alert to be Dave Matthews Dartmouth or um, Dave Matthews Biotech, Biotech Consulting, depending on you know, where you're really making um, digital footprints or where your results may actually be picked up. But it, I think it's really important to do a Google News Alert on your own name. A lot of people call that an ego search, but again, I think it's just really important to know how people are talking about you, whether you're being tagged in a Facebook album that you might not be thrilled about the picture for, or somebody's mentioned you in an article, or something that you submitted for publication got published, and it got some press. It's really helpful to know what people are saying about you. And also searching on those keywords of interest can help too. And finally, I find it to be one of the most efficient tools I've ever seen for conducting employer research. In terms of researching employers, Dartmouth has at least three databases, and Carrie and Catherine probably have others that they recommend, that they pay a lot of money for, that gives you access to company information that you couldn't get if you weren't here, um, and that many libraries don't carry. Um, my favorite one is called Global Business Browser, or OneSource.com, and you need to meet with a reference librarian in order to get the access password for that, that particular database. But it essentially lets you type in a company name. You can, you can type in what information you want, including information about their subsidiary holdings, when they've been in the news, how many employees they've come up with, um, their key indicators of financial health, and all of that you can get in less than 60 seconds. So you can get an overall snapshot of the companies. You can take it home, you know, use it for your use in terms of researching for interviews and really impress people just by that simple report. So I recommend Global Business Browser, Hoover's, and Factiva are three of my favorite sites. Again, general things to look at with employer research, company size, budget, locations, growth, revenue, profit. Um, if it is overwhelming to you, ask a reference librarian. They have lots of experience doing this. Um, but I think it's really useful to use these tools and, and to use them so that you can benchmark your organization's performance against other peer competitors in the market. You don't want to go into an interview and say, hey, I saw you got slammed in the third quarter. What happened? You know, there, there are better ways to phrase that, and career services can help you with that. Um, you might say instead, what's your long-term growth strategy? I noticed you've made some changes over the last quarter. Um, could you give me any insight into how this might affect my particular position? or whether it doesn't affect it at all. Um, but again, this information it can be very, very helpful. Tweetfeel is an example of a Twitter um, spin-off or application that you can look at that, that scans um, input from Twitter, and it tells you consumer perceptions. So for example, if I typed in Comcast, I could get a sense of how many people were happy with Comcast and how many people were sad. So yesterday, one of the most to popular topics was NBC. So I did a quick scan. I stopped it because I was going to be there all night because there had been so many comments on NBC. Um, but it basically told me that 77% of the people who were commenting were commenting negatively. So if I was an executive of NBC or someone who was in marketing research, that's something I'd really want to know. And in terms of company culture, while you never want to say anything about a bad company culture online, many people do. <laughs> and so I think it can be helpful to know what other people are saying. Um, the next section of this presentation is going to be all about how to find job leads. And I'm going to take you through four different t sites and um, methods that you can use to find leads. First, they're traditional job search boards, such as Dartboard, which is available through Career Services, Monster.com, and CareerBuilder. Next, we're going to talk about aggregator sites, which are some of my favorite job search boards. I really don't feel like there's any, for me, I recommend the aggregators much more than I do the Monster.com or CareerBuilders, because the aggregators pick up the 
individual job search boards. Then I'm going to talk about RSS feeds, which are just getting, arranging your technology so that leads are essentially pushed into you so you can get the information about job search positions how you want it. And finally, I'm going to talk about two places on social media where you can find job leads. The first one is traditional job search boards. And I would never ever tell you not to look at Dartboard because I think it's a really valuable source of listings and it's a list of employers and alumni who are specifically seeking Dartmouth students and Dartmouth grads. So I think it's really important to pay attention to the listings provided through your alma mater. And many of the students that I worked with at Thayer years ago are still happily employed with opportunities that they got through alums. Um, I saw one last week in DC, which was fantastic. Um, and so always, always, you know, keep that in mind as I, sh as I share with you these other sources. So Dartboard or Thayer Link um, are the, the appropriate sources for that. Um, I believe that Dartmouth, that Thayer students also have access to Dartboard. Unfortunately, postdocs don't have access to job boards, but I am going to show you some other um, position opportunities. So again, with a job board, you plug in your interests, your resume, and you receive leads of jobs. If you're using sites like Monster or Career Builder regularly, you want to refresh your resume. Because when recruiters look at resume databases, the resumes come up in the system based on when they were entered. So for example, when I worked as a recruiter and I used resume databases, the first resumes that I would see were the resumes that had been submitted within the last seven days. And then I had to go down to the second or third or even fifth page to find resumes that were more than a week old. So it's a little bit time intensive in terms of the other way. This is the newer way, which I really like, which is an aggregator. Aggregator sites are great because you can plug in what and where you're looking for, and you can find results across sites. So for example, here, I searched for an electrical engineer entry level in Boston, Massachusetts, and I found 37 different positions. And for each position, you can see where the company is that listed it. So this position is at Helicos Biosciences in Cambridge and was listed by Highland Capital Partners. This one was listed by Ad Osram Sylvania and was listed at Osram Sylvania. So this is a company posting. So for each of those positions, you can see the original source and where they came from. And again, it just gathers information from multiple job boards. One of the best things about these aggregators is then you can take a search result and you can program it so the leads come directly to you via email. Now most of these sites already have this set up so that when you create an account, you can tell them what you're looking for and they'll send you a listing once a week or once every couple days. The challenge with this sometimes is when the perfect job comes up, sometimes people want to hire right away. So for example, when I was working as a recruiter, I had a CEO who might come into my office and say on Monday and say, I want somebody in that seat in two weeks. You know, period. I don't care who it is, I want someone in that seat and I want them to be qualified. And so employers are working under a different timeline sometimes. So if you use this kind of system, the leads will come to you as they appear. And you can set this up on multiple channels, including aggregators, including Craigslist, Indeed, and Simply Hired. And all you do is that initial search, again, electrical engineer, entry level, Boston, Massachusetts, and then go through and essentially highlight the search results at the top, copy and paste the search results. It's going to be a long URL and you're going to dump it into another site. So there are two sites that I'm going to recommend to you today to do this. The first is feedmyinbox.com and this is on your slide and this helps you get job leads by email. It's really simple. 
All you do is copy that URL, paste it in the box, give them your email address, and submit it. And then whenever something hits that particular site, it will send it directly to your email. The second one is the Google Reader. Um, I don't know if any of you are using the Google Reader right now, but that one just lets you add a subscription. And when you add a subscription, then all the time, whenever that comes up as a lead, you can then open the reader up and you'll see a whole list of them just sitting there waiting for you to review. So it's a terrific way to really take that 50 hours a month <laughs> that the average job seeker is spending online for a position and really reduce it. You know, because you're not having to proactively go out and search for positions every week. You're just going in, setting up a few searches, and then you're getting the results in your inbox as it happens. So it's a nice cheat sheet. Um, two additional leads through social media are Tweet My Jobs on Twitter. Um, as I mentioned briefly last week, employers love this because it saves them hundreds of dollars. The cost to post a position on Tweet My Jobs is a dollar per day. The cost for me to post a position through Monster.com two years ago, or three years ago when I was in Lebanon, New Hampshire, was about $340. So if you think about that cost savings and the immediacy of that, it's huge from the employer's perspective and also has a lot of reach. With Tweet My Jobs, you can set um, um, location and also a position type. And then again, have the information submitted to you. You can also submit a resume to the system. And it's over the last 30 days, they've had over 1.3 million jobs tweeted. Those aren't individual positions because some of those have been a mul posted multiple times. Um, but 958 individual jobs in the last hour alone. Um, and I looked, when I looked at this, it was at night. So it wasn't during the height of day when employers are actually posting information. So it's a fantastic resource. Um, again, you, get the, you sign up to get notified of the positions and you get the job listings by tweet or text message. You in many cases, the job listings will come to your cell phone. I don't encourage this all the time because it can get expensive. You do have to pay the carrier cost. But if you have unlimited text messages and you're on the go a lot, it can be a really great way to get notified of leads. Employers can search the resume database if you allow them to. Um, the one drawback to tweet my jobs for some of you may be that you really do have to get a Twitter account. So you can't do it unless you're on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn is also a great place for leads. And one of the best ways to look for link jobs on LinkedIn is to do an advanced search. So for example, here I did a, a, um, a search for consulting positions that were entry level in any industry, which is pretty broad. It came up with several pages of listings. I picked one particular just to show you. And essentially, the way it works is you can you basically highlight the job that you're looking at, and it will say, find people in your network. So for example, my network in LinkedIn, again, as we discussed last week, it's based on three levels of connections. So my network has about, I think, 2 million potential contacts in it because I've built it up to be several hundred people. And essentially, I can see that there's one person in my network who works at this particular company. Then if I, post, I clicked on him, I didn't do that for his own privacy. I could see who I know him through. And then if it was a connection I felt strong enough, I could ask for an introduction either before I applied for the job or after I applied for the job just to let him know that I'd made the connection with his potential company as an employer and what my background was. Those are some great ways to find leads. Then using that information, you then want to position yourself to be an attractive candidate. And so one of the questions that I got last week was, how do I find the right keywords? So I took this particular position example, and I looked at the job description, and I looked at keywords that came up. So the keywords for this position, which again was an entry-level consulting project, were market research, bachelor's degree, 
analytic thinking, which is often analytical thinking, project management, handling, handling multiple tasks simultaneously, and Microsoft PowerPoint, Excel, and SPSS. So for example, if I was submitting a resume to this particular employer, I might start off the resume by just creating a couple bullet points at the top. And one of them might be, you know, bachelor's degree in economics and biology, if this is, this is actually a biotech consulting opportunity. Um, or chemistry, wh whatever the degree is, you certainly don't want to lie about your degree, but <laughs> you want to make sure it's appropriate for your background. But you might start off the resume showing that you have this background that's relevant. Um, you would make sure that you have information in your summary, and you may be able to do this within a traditional Dartmouth resume standpoint so that you just make it clear that you have a bachelor's degree, so you spell out bachelor. You spell out that you've done a marketing research project as part of your classwork, that you have strong analytical skills, and use the word project management in your resume. And all of those things are going to help your resume have a higher ranking when it goes through on the applicant tracking side. Because remember what I said last week is that essentially whenever an employer receives your resume after you've applied online, Many of them are using scanning technology that looks for keywords and that gives you a ranking before you even get the, the document. So this is a good way to, to just basically optimize your search engine attractiveness by simply using the keywords that are already in the job description. And then finally, in terms of, again, going back to my recipe for success, Again, in terms of positioning yourself to be an attractive candidate, you always want to target your resume and develop some kind of customized summary. You want to show that you've researched the company and the organization in your cover letter and that you understand the job and show that you understand the overall function of the job and the work environment size if you've been able to determine that. So essentially, you want to have a conversation with the employer. Because as we started, as, as I said when I opened today, 60 to 80 percent of job leads come, or 68 percent was the guess over here, come when people establish that they have a sense of connection. So you want to create that sense of connection. And an employer doesn't know how much you care about them or how important the potential job is to you until you tell them. I mean, obviously, you don't want to say, I'm going to have to go on food stamps if I don't get a job because I graduated 15 months ago and I can't find anything. And you don't want to show them your personal anxiety, but you do want to show them your professional enthusiasm for what you do. Um, and I think any time you have a conversation with them that shows that you've taken the time to do research, it makes a big difference. Um, I had a client in New York City that got turned down by a Wall Street firm twice in the fall for a position. They liked her enough to bring her back in to just talk to her about her interests and said, you're too senior for this and you're too junior for this. So there's no place for you here. She wrote a thank you note. She said, essentially, I'm really sad. <laughs> you know, because I feel like I, if I were, I understand that my skills are relatively junior for this position. But I also see the opportunity to learn this and this and this, and these are things I haven't done before. And I'm confident that I would show you enough of that that I could be promoted into a senior position later on. She sent the note on a Thursday afternoon. On Monday, she got a call. They said, we'd like to see you. And on Tuesday afternoon, she got a job offer, and she started the next week. She started a position that she had been turned down for twice. Not just once, but twice. And that happened because of the human connection. And so I think when you do all these things and you engage in genuine conversation with people, it's much easier to make that connection happen. As an overall summary, my theme is to use rapid technology, to use Web 2.0 applications and tools and bells and whistles to provide a high-touch job application that shows employers you care. Because in the end, it's always the person 
and the candidate who gets the job, not the machine. And I know how scary it is to hear that a lot of times employers aren't even going to see your resume because it's getting ranked by a computer before you ever even see it or by a, a, an application. I mean, I can just see the fear and I felt the fear myself, but it is something that you can conquer. And again, these are all ways to use technology to make the connection happen. And social media, in essence, is about using technology to build connections, not to be further isolated from one another. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.